It is good to be here this morning. Good to, good to see you. Wow, what, a, what an awesome crowd. Wonderful, wonderful. In case you didn't know, tonight starts Vacation Bible School. That wasn't obvious enough, right? 7 o'clock tonight. 7 o'clock, not 6. 7. Please make a mental note of that. We will have prayer session. Roger Mashburn may remind you of some of these things at the end, but repetition is a good thing. So we will have prayer session at 6.30, and the kids will make cards at 6.30, and, but we won't start till 7. So move everything back an hour this evening from what your normal schedule would be. And then it'll go on tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, 7 o'clock each night as well. So with a light meal at 6 for anyone that would like to come before vacation Bible school. So big week, my favorite week of the year, I guess, if I'm just going to be honest with you. I love being a kid, and this gives me an excuse to be one, and the elders can't fuss at me for being one. So it's all, it's all good, and I hope you'll be here. I'm looking forward to the adult classes this year. It's going to be a little different, and I think for you adults, typically you think of VBS as a children's thing, and certainly it does include a lot of children, we do hope, but uh, it's also for the adults, and I hope you'll be able to come this week as well and enjoy the Bible studies by uh, the various teachers as they rotate out. A lot of, lot of good, a lot of fun to be had this week. With that in mind, this morning, I thought, you know, We'll just start by giving you some introduction. So if you have your Bible with you, if you want to be opening them to Psalm 5, the fifth Psalm is where we'll start this morning. In case you didn't know and in case you haven't read the front of your family news, our theme for this year is Righteous Roundup. It's a Western type cowboy theme. Does some things behind me start to make a little more sense now and different things. And so what we're looking for is children that want to be righteous. What God is looking for is people that want to be righteous. And so I began to ask myself the question, what is righteousness? And what does being right look like. And so this morning I want you to go on a little journey with me as we study righteousness from a couple of aspects with a little overview from all four lessons, not to step on any of the speaker's topics for this week, but just kind of give you a preview of what's coming and then make some conclusions in the lesson yours. As I analyze righteousness, as I think about the concept of righteousness and how it relates and who's involved and how can it be acquired. And I began to look at it from two angles. The first angle I look at it from is God's angle. Oh, I don't know how many, 25, 30, 35, 40, maybe even as many as 50 Psalms. Close to a third of the Psalms have a reference to the idea of God's righteousness. So start there with me. You ready? Psalm 5 and verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. That idea, that concept, time would not allow, but it would be a great study for you personally at home for you to do a word search of righteousness just in the Psalms. Go through and read each one in its context of the Psalm in which it's found and, and identify what it is that the Psalmist is really after. Clearly in the fifth Psalm, he's after the righteousness of God. The desire to be led by God into His righteousness. If you flip over just a page or two maybe in your Bible to the 11th Psalm, I'll give you one more. The 11th Psalm and verse 7, the very last verse. For the Lord is 
righteous. Now here's you another fun study if you're looking for something to do to help improve your spiritual life at home. Go through and find every time it says the Lord is and fill in the blank. The Lord is and when you get done you will have a maybe not exhaustive but you will have a very comprehensive list to describe the nature and being of our God. Among that list would have to be Psalm 11 and verse 7. The Lord is righteous. But then notice what the psalmist goes on to say. He loves righteous deeds. Our theme for this week is righteous roundup. Wanted righteous children of God. That's the theme for the week. We're looking for people who understand that God is righteous. Not just that God is righteous, but that God desires for people to be righteous. You flip over in your New Testament, and you fast forward to the third chapter of the book of Romans. Cameron did a wonderful job using this passage last Sunday night in our youth night lesson. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, several times the righteousness of God is mentioned over and over. While you're flipping there, I'll remind you of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. You might remember what it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You see, we, 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 we promote this idea of seeking first the kingdom, and, and accurately so, but the verse doesn't end there. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the righteousness of God. In Romans 3 and verse 21, we're told that the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law Although it was the law and the prophets that bore witness to it, certainly. But the righteousness of God, verse 22, through faith in Jesus, for all who believe, for there is no distinction, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and so therefore we're justified by His grace. It is a gift through the redemption that is only found in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Verse 25 then, all of this to show God's righteousness. Verse 26, it was to show His righteousness. Jesus didn't come as a propitiation for our sins. Jesus didn't come as a redeeming one to die on the cross for our sins because we were righteous. Had had we been righteous, there would have been no need for any of that to take place. No, it is it is the righteousness of God, not our righteousness. And so I believe when we began to talk about the concept of a righteous roundup, the first thing we have to acknowledge is the righteousness of our God. God is right. God is righteous. Everything God has ever done has been to show forth or to display the righteousness by which His character is engulfed. But now, very quickly, shift with me to think about the opportunity or ability for you and I to be able to have some type of righteousness in and of ourselves, if you will, or by our own abilities, if you will, or because of the motivation that comes from our desires. We can desire, we can choose, we can seek to obtain a righteousness. Ultimately, understanding and appreciating that because of God who is righteous. If I were to compare it, I would compare it very quickly by parallel to that of love. You understand love only because God first loved you. 
If it were not because of God's love, or if it were not for God's love, then you and I could not love at all. But we don't sit back and say, okay, now I don't have to love because God's full of love. God is full of love whether you love or not. It doesn't change the, the love of God. But God is expecting of us, God is requiring of us, God is asking of us to act and conduct ourselves in a loving behavior, not only toward Him, but toward one another. Now with that understanding in mind then, come to the topic of righteousness. No, you cannot be righteous in and of yourselves. It only is because God is righteous. But we don't sit back and say, okay, God's righteous, so I don't have to be, or I don't have to do anything, because God is righteous. Furthermore, your righteousness, or the lack thereof, does not change or diminish the righteousness of God. In the same way you can't change or diminish the love of God, but with that same understanding, God has a desire for you and I to behave righteously. And so when you come over to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, where Brother Milton read a while ago, beginning in verse 3, we find Genesis 15 and verse 6, it is Abraham that believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul seemed to key on that theme because he would repeat this again in Galatians 3 and verse 6. James would key in on this theme. Those of you that think James and Paul are contradicting of each other, it's ironic. No, it's not. It's perfectly divine that they would quote the same verse in James 2 and verse 23. James mentions Abraham who was in perfect concordance with Paul, not contradictory at all. The importance of faith as it leads to a righteous standing before our God. And it goes on in those verses that Brother Milton read. In other words, if you and I are trying to earn righteousness, according to Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2, which are quoted in Romans 4 verses 7 and 8, as Brother Milton ended, if we're trying to earn righteousness, let's put all of our righteous deeds on one side and let's put all of our sin on the other side and what Psalm 32 says is our sin is going to always outweigh. It's going to always be heavier. It's going to always be more. The, the scale is never going to tip in our favor. We are going to be always indebted to our God of righteousness. So what does that mean? Does that mean you just try to add all you can on the scale over here of sin? So that it'll weigh more? So that God's righteousness can weigh? No. That is irrational logic. It doesn't work. And that's why Paul would say in Romans 6, should we continue in sin? Certainly, God forbid. Certainly not. Let it not be so. So there is an element by which you and I ascribe to righteousness. Because of that, you call it through faith. Absolutely. That's what Romans 4, drop down to verse 9. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. Drop down to verse 11. He received the seal of circumcision as a seal of righteousness. Drop down to verse 13. Well, the promise to Abraham and to his offspring would be that the heir of the world did not come through law, but through the righteousness of faith. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 25 says that righteousness is attained when we fulfill, when we keep, when we do all that God has commanded. In Job 27 and verse 6, apparently Job held to his righteousness. He apparently thought that he had some level of righteousness. And so as we think about this concept of righteousness, we have God who is righteous. And then we have us who God expects or who God desires or who God longs for us to behave in such a way, to conduct ourselves, to involve ourselves in things that would be righteous in nature. 
And so the Bible says in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's a desire. It's a longing for. And Jesus says, happy, blessed, good are those who have this hunger and this thirst to be righteous. We're having a righteous roundup this week. We're looking for people who want to be right with God. In Romans 6 and verse 13, just a couple of chapters over there, do you not, do not rather, present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for, it almost seems like to me you and I got a choice. What do you think? We get to choose unrighteousness or righteousness. There is no righteousness apart from God. Don't ever say, I ever told you that. Because that's a lie. The only righteousness that we can have is in God, from God, through God. But you and I get to choose. We can either choose to have that righteousness, or we can choose to present ourselves for the use of unrighteousness. God's not making that choice. He's given it to you. And so this week as we, as we study together, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put all of our adult speakers kind of out on a limb here, and y'all can thank me later. I didn't give them a whole lot. I gave them very little material. So it's going to be really interesting this week to watch these guys develop this material into an adult class. And I say that with all confidence in the guys. I'm not, I'm not doubting their ability at all. I'm just telling you that I gave them very little material, and so I'm very interested to watch it develop. I'm telling you, there are going to be some great adult lessons this week. I, these are not in order. They're just in the order I've got them. One of them is going to be on Abraham. They're in your bulletin what order they're in this week, but one of them's going to be on Abraham. It's going to be on obedience. You see, righteousness involves the willingness to do what God has asked of me. Obedience. A study from Genesis 12 where God calls Abram and later changes his name to Abraham. A study that leads up to chapter 22 of Genesis where God calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Wow. Obedience at its best. It's going to be a wonderful study of Abraham and helping us to be righteous, to develop the desire to be willing to do what God asks. Another one this week is on Dorcas. Dorcas is about fruitfulness. Righteous children of God are fruitful. You remember, you remember the, the, the discussion a few months ago now about faithfulness versus fruitfulness? There's a difference between faithfulness and fruitfulness. God is looking for fruitfulness. He's looking for His children to bear fruit if we're going to be righteous children. Obviously, Dorcas out of Acts chapter 9 there. But the point is, is that in order to be fruitful, there must be a willingness to focus on things that really matter. Faithfulness just, faithfulness just says this. we got to do this, 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 and this. Okay, then you can be faithful. Alright? Anybody can be faithful. You can be a faithful employee. You can be a faithful husband. You can be a faithful child. You can be a faithful Christian. God says, do this, 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 and this. Okay, one, two, three, four. Check, 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 check. But can you be fruitful? Can you be fruitful? You see, fruitful is a willingness to focus on the things that really matter, the priorities of God. You see, it ain't about, I just got to do this, this, and this. It's about, when I do this, what's going to be the outcome? What's the purpose? What's the goal? 
What's the desire? What does God want? You see, does God want me to come to church? Yes, He wants me to come to church. Okay, so if I'm going to be faithful, when, when this is over, you can check the box because you've been faithful. But did you come in here asking yourself, what can I, what can I learn? What can I gain? How can I be a better person having been to worship? Now then, we're in the category of fruitful. How can I be fruitful? Not just faithful, but fruitful. All right, I get off of you, brother. You can finish that one tonight, okay? That one is tonight, by the way. Another one this week is on Daniel. A righteous child of God prays. Daniel. Perhaps the most notable prayer in the book of Daniel is Daniel chapter 9. The problem is kids just don't get that one much, okay? So you back up to Daniel chapter 6 because he prays there. Apparently Daniel prays a lot. What do you think? Daniel chapter 6, the lion's den, right? Daniel gets in trouble because he's praying. You see, a righteous child of God prays. A righteous child of God is willing to ask for God's help. I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't continue on my own. I've got to have help. And that's what prayer does. Prayer humbles us. And as righteous children, we call upon our God in prayer. And if you really want a deep prayer... Read Daniel 9 instead of Daniel 6 for you adults where Daniel's praying for the Israelites, for his people, for God's people. The fourth one's on the Samaritan man, Luke chapter 10. Love the Samaritan man. Love what he did. In contrast to the Levite and the priest, righteous children of God are compassionate, willing to go the extra mile to help others compassionate, willing to be kind, willing to care, willing to go above and beyond. You see, there's fruitful living, right? Going above and beyond. Willingness, obedience, a willingness to do what God asks. Fruitfulness, a willingness to focus on what will really make an impact for the kingdom. Prayer, a willingness to focus on my need for God's help. Compassion, a willingness to focus on others in humility. That's part of the prescription for a righteous child of God. Our desire this week is to have a righteous roundup. You remember what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8? He said, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He says, finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But not just for me only, but to all those who love His appearing. Paul says, there's a crown of righteousness available for you and for you and for you and for everyone. The crown of righteousness that God is ready and willing to give those who will in obedience, those who will in a desire for fruitfulness, those who will in humble prayer, those who will in compassion and love for the cross of Jesus would come willing to accept God on His terms and to receive the righteousness that He offers with whatever ability we have to be righteous and to present our members in obedient faith to be used for righteousness. I'm telling you because I know that the jail and the bank can come down real quick and baptism can occur. They can split, let me tell you. And it can happen. I know it can because I have put it together this morning. If that's standing in your way, you, you, I can get it out of your way. Quick. Don't, don't, don't let that stop you from having a desire to be righteous. Because it, it's no excuse. Don't let Satan use that. Because it was designed 
for you to obey the gospel with it up there. Second Peter two verse twenty one. 2 Peter 2 and verse 21, the Bible says it would have been better for them to have never known the way of righteousness than having known the way to turn from it. Peter makes it very clear and very graphic with that whole dog and, and sow and, and, and very graphic. It had been better to have never known the way of righteousness. It had been never known, to have known what you needed to do to be right than to have known it and refused it. I'm telling you, God is righteous. He desires for us to be right with Him. And there's nothing, no, there's nothing that can provide that Accept the blood of Jesus. And so I'm asking you this morning, if you need to be righteous, why don't you start the roundup this week by becoming righteous yourself through the blood of Jesus as together we stand and sing.